But I do want to bring in Alexis McGill Johnson, who's the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood. I want to go ahead and get your initial reaction to this ruling by a Texas right wing judge uh, to stay the approval, the FDA approval of Mifepristone. Uh, thank you, Joy. Uh, look, this is a reckless decision. This is a decision that is based on junk science. It is going to have devastating consequences for patients. The thing I want to most be clear about right now is that for at least the next seven days, access is still available for patients. And it's important to say that because we know that all of these rulings, all of these bills that have been introduced over the last uh, however long have meant that People are sowing chaos and confusion for people. And for right now, for the people who are making decisions about what they, are, they need to do in this moment, they are still able to get access to care. But for this to happen in this week, the same week when voters went to the ballot in Wisconsin and demonstrated how much they cared about making these own decisions for themselves, for this judge to come down and make it clear that no respect for our ability to make decisions about our own bodies is incredibly telling. This is a clear crisis, not only for democracy, but for freedom. Well, I mean, I think if those who have read The Handmaid's Tale or watched the series understand that it was a right wing Christian religious cult, essentially, that took over the United States and stripped women of all of their rights, leaving them the only choices uh, to be a handmaid, essentially forced birth incubator uh, or be a prostitute or a maid, um, which it sounds pretty spot on with what a lot of folks in this country seem to think are the only purposes that women have in the world. Um, I want to bring in Minnie Tamaraju to add Minnie Tamaraju to this conversation. She's the president of NARAL Pro-Choice Pro -Choice America. Um, Minnie, your, your uh, initial reaction. Look, this decision tells us we were spot on about who Matthew Kaczmarek is. You know, um, we read through the opinion. My team is still reading through it and uh, doing the analysis. But our understanding is he evokes all of the most horrific extreme arguments against medication abortion in this case. And he makes it clear that is the direction he is willing to head short of a Fifth Circuit action. So um, it is not a surprise. It is that does not make it any less distressing. And in light of what has happened this week in places like Idaho, and to Alexis's point, the strength of the community in Wisconsin, it's really, really discouraging that this judge went ahead with this most extremist route. And we're just hoping uh, the DOJ and the Fifth Circuit will take quick action. And Alexis, if you could just sort of give us sort of the, the, the state of play here. I mean, uh, medication abortion, that's about half or a little more than half of the ways in which women obtain this, this health care, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, consistently so. And I think even increasingly more important, given the fact that we are now nine months post the Dobbs decision, we have seen over 300 restrictions introduced in 46 states. And states have no access to abortion or very limited access. And medication abortion is one of those ways in which people are able to make decisions uh, in, in, in time to not have to travel in ways that uh, will deny them access. So this is not just about what's happening in Texas. The fact that this case against the FDA approval means that it's going to impact New York and California and Illinois and Vermont and all of the places where people are now traveling way out of the South in order to get access to care. Um, and so this is the entire country, the entire nation needs to be on watch now that our literally our, our ability to, to have equal control over our own bodies is under attack. And many, we've already seen in the state of Idaho um, a bill to make it illegal to travel. So they're already starting to, to lock women in and say, you can't move, you can't travel. And in this case, they're talking about anyone under 18, but that means an aunt, you know, a, a, an older sister, a doctor. They're trying to frighten people into even helping women. We've seen that in Texas with this bounty law. So what you're seeing is the right to abortion being squeezed by making doctors afraid to treat you, by making your family members afraid to help you, by making an Uber driver afraid to drive you, by saying that if you travel across state lines or get close to the border in the state of Idaho and you might have, you know, Mifepristone with you, that's a crime. And making, you know, in the state of South Carolina, they're proposing potentially adding a death penalty. This is, this is the handmaid's tale, as Lisa said. 
women in this country are essentially being told you are an incubator. The state owns your body the minute that you are pregnant and there's nothing you can do and no one you can turn to. I, I can't imagine anything closer to slavery than that. This is all by design. I mean, look, the way that patients have been getting served post jobs, particularly in Texas, where I actually am right now um, with my family because I'm from Texas, it has been by folks leaving their state, right? Going across borders, going to uh, clinics like Planned Parenthoods, right there at the border of some of these states, getting access to Mifepristone, which is incredibly safe, as we've said many times, safer than Tylenol, uh, has been approved for over 23 years, and getting access access to that care through telemedicine in some cases. So these laws that you just outlined are designed to close the last available possibility for the most desperate Americans who need this care. And it is wild, completely dystopian, as you said, uh, completely evil, and designed to intimidate and create a perfect storm of confusion for patients. And it's so important to call out the opposition here. You know, groups like Susan B. Anthony List have been, who've been blaming providers for for being unclear to their patients. And it is truly beyond the pale that they are still making those arguments when they have designed these laws in a way to create mass confusion and maximum harm to American women. And knowing that rich women will just get on a plane and fly to Europe and still get abortions anyway, it's poor women, it's women of color, they're going to suffer. I want to give the last word to you, Lisa, right. because what is the root for this? So the Fifth Circuit gets it. What happens? Because my fear is it winds up right back at the Supreme Court and Samuel Alito in his smugness and reverence for the 19th century simply says, too bad, so sad, you are incubators, L get over it. It's my fear, too. I mean, the one thing I can say is that on one hand, the Supreme Court might be better or slightly better than the Fifth Circuit. It is the most ideological of our federal circuit courts of appeals right now. I don't have any confidence that the Fifth Circuit will either stand up for women or even stand up for the right of the FDA to decide which drugs are safe and effective. I mean, this decision doesn't just undermine women and their right to abortion. It undermines the entire regulatory state, which is a larger project of the larger conservative movement. They don't want federal agencies to have power to make decisions because they don't like what happens in things that they care about, like oil and gas and the environmental movement. They want agencies to have less power. With respect to the Supreme Court, Joy, I think the one thing that we can say is that Judge Kaczmarek has so squarely across the board decided for the plaintiffs on everything from whether they had standing to bring this suit to whether they exhausted their administrative remedies at the FDA. I'm hoping that the Supreme Court can poke holes in one of the things that allowed the plaintiffs to even bring this case in the first place, because it, it has legal experts like me scratching their heads about whether you can, 23 years after the yeah. fact, challenge a decision by the FDA. This is minority rule, everyone. This is why you vote, except that when you vote, they just expel the people that you voted for. This is minority rule. This is a seizure of democracy. A, the minority in this country, let's just be clear, they have a minority view. They are 30-70 on all of these issues, and they are seizing control of you. Um, we need to pay attention to this. Lisa Rubin, Alexis McGill Johnson, Minnie Timaraju, thank you very much. Make no mistake, Tennessee Republicans stripped 130,000 Tennesseans of representation in the State House. Republican Speaker Cameron Sexton defended this unprecedented move, claiming he wanted to maintain House order and didn't want Democrats to set a new precedent for breaking decorum. Republicans say Representatives Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, and Gloria Johnson broke decorum by speaking out last week about the shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville. Sexton incomprehensibly compared the actions of three Tennessee lawmakers standing in the floor of the House in which they served to what happened on January 6th. His accusations are both laughable and deeply insulting. On January 6th, hordes of Trump supporters violently assaulted police, destroyed public property, and defecated in the Capitol. In Tennessee, three Democratic lawmakers spoke out of turn because the speaker turned off their microphones and silenced them. Oh, and they had a bullhorn. Totally the same as a violent insurrection, right? But here's the thing. They don't actually care about decorum. During Representative Justin Pearson's expulsion, Republican Andrew Farmer lectured Pearson on how he should behave. His comments were just dripping in condescension and disdain. Take a listen. 
just because you don't get your way, you can't come to the well, bring your friends, and throw a temper tantrum with an adolescent bullhorn. And don't start by commandeering the well while we're conducting business here in this Tennessee General Assembly. That's why you're standing there, because of that temper tantrum that day, for that yearning to have attention. That's what you wanted, but you're getting it now. So I just advise you, if you want to conduct business in this house, file a bill. The members were unbowed and unbothered because this isn't really about decorum. It's about stifling democracy and consolidating power and ignoring an ever-changing, ever-frustrated electorate. The glaring tell was the adjudication of the perceived crime. Only two of the members were expelled, and they just so happened to be black. The expulsions, while a lasting stain on Tennessee and on American democracy, could be short-lived. The city council rep for Representative Justin Jones' district is expected to reinstate him on Monday. It is unclear what will happen with expelled Representative Justin Pearson. And joining me now are two Democratic members of the Tennessee State House: Representative John Ray Clemens, the Democratic Caucus Chair, and Representative Sam McKenzie, Chairman of the Tennessee Black Caucus. Uh, I, I want to play you for you, um, Representative Clemens, because uh, you were kind of giving me life um, during your your moment uh, to present um, uh, at that uh, expulsion hearing. Let's just play that. We are talking about nothing less than 75 people overruling the wishes of 78,000 people. And you're going to cut off debate? Give me a break. Is this a circus? You are talking about kicking somebody out of this body. Grow up. If you can't sit through a conversation or a debate on something no less than expelling a colleague, grow up. Get out of here. You don't belong here. They, they obviously didn't listen to you, um, Representative. But I, I want to ask you, because you represent an area of Nashville, and you talked about, uh, you, that I, I believe your district is not far from Representative Jones, former Representative Jones' district. I want to ask you about what we were talking about in the previous block. How much of this fight is about cowing Nashville? and forcing this multiracial city that contributes one-third of the GDP of the state and cowing them and punishing them for not wanting the RNC convention and seizing control of their economic might, seizing control of the airport, seizing control of the convention center, and essentially turning Nashville into a plaything of the MAGA right. Well, thank you for having me and for shining a light on this injustice. As, as you could see from that clip, my, my colleagues find it very uncomfortable to witness injustice, apparently, uh, even though they were the ones, you know, carrying this out. Nashville has been under attack from day one. Memphis is always under attack as well. We continue to face an uphill battle. You know, we have one party rule in the state of Tennessee, and they want to control everything from the state house to the courthouse. And that's what you have seen. And you just laid, laid out all the bills just from this session alone. And that's just this year. Uh, this has gone on for years. And so they just want to consolidate all power and control all money. I believe in the previous segment, you laid out the percentage of the revenue that comes out of the city I represent. Me and, and, and Representative Jones represent. Our, our districts are above each other. We, we, we represent the same neighborhoods. Um, we were redistricted, but we share neighborhoods. And so the people want him there. They knew who they were electing. And it is offensive for them to violate our democracy and replace him in that manner. And Representative McKenzie, you uh, chair the Tennessee Black Caucus. It's very clear when they singled out um, the one uh, white member of the Tennessee Three and let her survive by one vote. But she's been really brutalized as well. I mean, forced to sit in sort of a closet because she didn't vote for the House Speaker. And she's been punished as well. And she barely survived that vote. And they are sticking together. But I do want to talk to you just a little bit about what's happening um, around the scenes as well. In Memphis, allegedly, there there is a threat overhanging that if um, uh, uh, that if just Justin Pearson is reinstated, that Memphis will be uh, punished economically, that their that funding for major projects will be taken away if he is reinstated. It sounds to me like there is an atmosphere of threat in the state of Tennessee around these two young black men. 
It absolutely is. Uh, that, that That's unfortunately not the first time that, that Memphis has been threatened or with one of those, if you don't get along, this is what we're going to do to you. We're going to cut you off uh, at at the knees. It's, it's terribly unfortunate. I'm extremely happy for, for Representative Johnson. She served Knoxville just like I, I do, but it's, it's eerily uh, awkward when the, the one person that's exonerated is, is, is the person not of color. You know, I'm happy for her, but to have our two youngest African-American members um, expelled for a rules violation, a five to 10 second rules violation is asinine. It's asinine when they break the rules every day. And well, I mean, there that is one of the things that was so outrageous, Representative Clemens. I mean, you have had a member urinate on the seats of other members. You've had people uh, accused of multiple sexual violations who were not thrown out. Um, as the great Lawrence O'Donnell pointed out last night, there's never been a Klan member in the state of Tennessee ever kicked out of the state legislature for being in the Klan. Um, you now have a national spotlight on Tennessee. You've had President, Bi uh, President Biden and former President Obama weigh in. Vice President Harris was there today. Uh, what do you think that national spotlight will do, um, and will it change or alter the course of events? Well, I certainly hope so. This is an unfortunate way to sh shine a light on Tennessee, but I sincerely appreciate this White House and this administration. They've been here. They stepped up with disaster assistance today. Uh, the first lady was here holding vigil with our community after the loss last week and the terrible tra tragedy. And of course, the vice president was here this afternoon where Representative McKenzie and I were able to join her at Fisk University, an HBCU here in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, with the light on on this situation, I'm I'm glad the light is finally being shown on this because we have been facing injustice in the Tennessee House of Representatives for, for years. You know, we are not allowed to speak. We are cut off from debate. Um, you know, our bills are killed for sport when we demand and we are elected by the same amount of people, if not more than some of our Republican colleagues. So I hope people know and I hope they witnessed yesterday that the Tennessee Democrats are strong. I'm the chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, and I hope everybody came away from that knowing that we stand united. We are we are intelligent, smart and strong people who fight for each other and we have each other's backs. And it, and it is a depressing and sad day in the state of Tennessee that two of my youngest colleagues who happen to be vocal, strong, and valuable voices within my Democratic caucus and the Black caucus have been removed from office. This is unjust, and it's offensive to our democracy, and it's a black eye on the state of Tennessee. And we are going to continue yeah. fight together. And that, that is the thing, Representative McKenzie. It is sort of the microcosm uh, of the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party. The Republican Party is very monoracial. The Democratic Party actually is a multicultural party. It's a multiracial party. We can see it right here on the screen but with the two of you. But this it, we, the, sort of the theme we're talking about tonight is this abrogation of multiracial democracy. In your state, they have passed laws or attempting to banning drag shows. Um, banning abortion, attempting to control women's uh, bodily autonomy. There is an overwhelming demand from young and old Tennesseans for gun reform, for red flag laws. These are 70-30 issues in favor of change. Just talk for a minute, I'm going to let you close, on the anti-democracy piece of this, because that Republican majority is denying the will of the majority of Tennesseans every single day and punishing two black young lawmakers because they will not comply. That's absolutely it. This has been brewing for really for years, you know, and, and they really think that they represent the, the uh, state of Tennessee. It is, you can cut it like uh, with a knife, just the fact that they think that we don't have a voice. Their bill should go. Our should, 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 should be stunned. Issues that are core to our democracy get cut off without any debate. That day was just, it was a combination of frustration. And we have a diverse party. We have a diverse way of expressing ourselves. And, and it just came out and came through that, that day. But it's been building.
they're, they're passing gun laws to have teachers carry guns when when without really any training. They're, they're passing these, these, these LGBT laws for no good reason. And they just keep piling on and piling on and telling us to just sit in the corner while we do the people's business. Well, the world yeah. is shining the light on the state of Tennessee right now.